Welcome in to Locked On Knicks. Will Jalen Brunson be the MVP this year? Could Josh Hart be the sixth man of the year? Could the Knicks have any one of a number of guys be the defensive player of the year? Well, the odds are out, so we can at least kind of place some theoretical money on it. Let's talk about it next on Locked On Knicks. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome in to Locked On Knicks. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more as the playoffs wind down. The sports stop sporting like we want them to, but this summer FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a booster or bonus daily. That's right, there's something for everyone all day, every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. And I want to thank you guys for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today and every day, whether you're checking us out on your favorite podcast platform or taking in the sights and sounds on YouTube. We appreciate you making us part of your daily routine. Make sure you hit that auto-download function on your favorite podcast app or the notification bell on YouTube so you never miss an episode because even during this doldrumy part of the offseason, we're still coming to you guys at least three days a week, if not more. So. If, the, if any big news breaks, we'll always be right there. But minimum three times a week and then five times a week during the season. So you never want to miss an episode. I'm Alex Wolf. I'm Aaron Chief. And Nick's like the Strickland, which you can find at Strick.land. And he is Gavin Shaw, your favorite play-by-play broadcaster, your favorite play-by-play broadcaster. And today, Gavin, we've got some odds to get into. Uh, FanDuel odds came out. Of course, we mentioned who our show sponsor is. So, of course, we know what odds we got to talk about. Uh, FanDuel uh, has the odds for all the NBA awards that just came out which includes our very own Jalen Brunson. So Gavin, he is currently listed as plus 1,600, which is the seventh best odds in the NBA. Uh, Too little, too much. How much of your real or fake money are you putting on that? What do you think about plus 1,600 for Jalen Brunson for MVP? Yeah, I wish we still had Monopoly Go as a sponsor. I can say my Monopoly money that I'm going to put on this, but I can't because they left us. Hopefully they come back. Anyways, um, uh, plus 1600. They're not paying us for that anymore. We got to right. bleach that now. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, can't say that anymore. Anywho, uh, a name we never have to bleep, Jalen Brunson. Uh, plus 1600 odds, 0.7 best odds in the league. He is just behind Nikola Jokic, uh, Luka Doncic, Shea Gilders Alexander, Joel Embiid, Giannis Antetokounmpo, and Anthony Edwards, which I would maybe spoiling my answer here. I would say that's all fair. He is just ahead of uh, one spot. I thought this was surprising and interesting and a little scary. He was one spot ahead of Victor Wembanyama, who already is the eighth best odds heading into his second year, second year in the NBA to win MVP. I I cannot. I would assume it hasn't happened since someone like Lou Alcindor or maybe Magic Johnson or Larry Bird that someone in their second year in the NBA won MVP. I gotta look that up. Did David uh, Robinson. David Robinson, maybe David Robinson. That's a good guess. He came in older. Um, mm-hmm. Jason Tatum is next. John ja Morant, Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, LeBron James, Tyrese Halliburton, Devin Booker, um, all behind Jalen Brunson. First of all, I'm going to say that's a lot of respect for Jalen Brunson. So I appreciate that. Well-deserved after he finished fifth a year ago. That being said, Alex, I don't know if I'm going to do this every time, but I wrote it down for this one. I'm going to put the likelihood at about two out of 10. And, and the, that does not mean I think it's 20%, more of a relative scale. Um, I think last year was his window to get it done where he had a full second half of the year with Julius Randle hurt. And, and he was just pouring in 30 plus points game after game after game, uh, monster volume, pretty good efficiency, single-handedly dragging the Knicks to the second seed. And that was like, in my mind, pretty much the best case scenario for a Jalen Brunson MVP run. And he finished fifth and it was, it was a distant fifth. Like there was, there was no real argument for him being any higher than that. That wouldn't be made on our podcast or, or over on Nick's film school or another Nick's podcast. Like, I think that was about as high as he could get. I think the other model for a point guard winning, which is how Steve Nash won twice, which is a little bit similar to how Derek Rose won though. He didn't quite have the monster assist numbers. Um, the other model would be that the Knicks have the best record in the league and he puts up something like 24 points, 11 assists a game, great efficiency, low turnovers. Um, but outside of the low turnovers and the great efficiency, the 11 assists, that is just not really his game. I could see someone like Tyrese Halliburton. I don't know why I said it. That was a very weird way to say his name. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I put, I put a little, little French on that for, for his trip. Um, I could see someone like Tyrese doing that down the road on Indiana. I just don't really think that's Jalen Brunson. I, I think we get something like 26 points, five assists for him. The Knicks have a great season. Um, but even if they have the best record in the league, Alex, I, I still don't think he wins MVP this year. Uh, yeah, I mean, I kind of, 
I, I think that there's a world where he wins it if they end up with the best overall record in the NBA. I think that's probably what it would take. Would be, be or at least the number one seed in the East, which I feel like by default is going to be the number one seed in the NBA. Like I just don't. If it's going to be a dogfight between the Knicks and the Celtics for that number one seed, like, and the Knicks come out on top, there's no way that, at least in my opinion, that any team in the West is going to beat that number. Um, just because for whatever reason, like, I think the East is tougher, but I think the West beats each other up more. I, I don't know how. West to... is more depth for sure. Yeah, like it's a like the West. I just feel like has less outright tanking teams at this point. Um, although maybe that changes this year a little bit. I don't know. Um, but it seems like most of the teams in the West tried to get better, even if they didn't get fantastic. So there's still going to be every game is going to be a, a slog there. Whereas, you know, in the East, you still have like Washington, Charlotte's still probably going to be pretty bad. Brooklyn. Yeah, Brooklyn is going to be terrible. Like Detroit, as much as they want to get better, probably not going to be that much better. Like, I don't think Tobias Harris moves the needle that much to take you from like bottom five to suddenly like playing team or something <laughs> he um, might take them to bottom one that's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you listen to sixers fans probably um but yeah it's it, you know i i think that that's the scenario where i could see brunson winning mvp otherwise it's going to be a pretty pretty uphill battle for him i mean just to compete like Jokic, Jokic is always just going to be right there and like the nuggets are still going to be so good and his efficiency numbers and everything that he does it's just like between him and and Giannis, it's like you know the, those guys are just going to put up the crazy numbers that just the impact stats that make you go like oh my god like these guys are the most important players in the NBA and Jokic just like as a center gets like triple doubles every single night and clearly is extremely integral to what his team does. Whereas I feel like if the Knicks lost Jalen Brunson for a couple games, they could probably stay afloat a little bit. Like the Nuggets lose Jokic, and if you're talking about like the most valuable player. Uh, you know, for the people to view it that way, which I try to, I, I think that's the way, the proper way to look at the award rather than just like best player on best team or like guy who put up crazy stats or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like the guy that if, if you plucked him off of his team, how bad would they be? Like Jokic is really high on that list. And that's always going to be an uphill battle. Giannis is going to be high on that list. Luca's super high on that list. The Knicks this year, like obviously get a lot worse without Brunson on the team, but I think, you know, hopefully Brunson will miss much if any time. But I think if the Knicks lose him for a couple games this year for various injury tune-ups here and there, I think there's a world where you can have them still kind of not skip as much of a beat because they just have really, really good depth. And it's going to be sort of similar as much as I hate to make a comparison to like the Celtics where people talk about all the time, like, well, how could you possibly vote Jason Tatum the MVP, you know, which he, he hasn't gotten. But like, how could you possibly vote that? when he has so much depth on his team that his team would still be winning 55 games, even without him on the team, you know? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's, I think that might hurt Brunson a bit when it comes to MVP. Um, I did pull the youngest MVP stats, by the way, oh, which yeah. I want to share. Uh, I, I couldn't find someone who won it in their second year, unless I just haven't quite looked at enough names yet. I'm just kind of clicking through guys, but Wes Unseld and Will Chamberlain won his rookies, which is, Pretty impressive. That's, That's why I forgot about that. And they won the finals that year, right? What Wes Unseld and the Bullets. Yes, if I'm not mistaken. Like Wes Nine, Unseld, right? I think he, yeah. he was him. I mean, yeah. he was he was crazy. 14 points, 18 boards that year, which is also crazy. A crazy yeah. MVP stat line. Um, and I think Kareem won it his uh, maybe Kareem won it his second year. Hold on. So yeah. Yep. Kareem won it his second year. So that's 71, right? Yep. Yeah. So that was that was uh 71 he won that award so yeah uh but yeah so that's that's interesting company for Wemby but either way Gavin uh yeah Jalen Brunson's case pretty tough it's gonna be tough for him I think it's gonna be an uphill battle and it's gonna take it's gonna take a real phenomenal showing from the Knicks as an overall and then everybody just kind of rally behind Brunson as the face of that team and he sort of already is and he is already the face of this Knicks revival so maybe that's enough. Like if they get the number one seed in the East and the number one seed in the NBA, I could see it happening. Even if people do try to make the case of, well, the team is so deep and blah, blah, blah. I think it'll just be like, yeah, but look at what it took for the Knicks to get to this point and to scratch and claw their way back. And he's the face of that. Like there's going to be a pretty big groundswell, I think. And we started to kind of see that this past year and the year prior, as far as, you know, fans of, or fa maybe not fans of other teams, but like the national media, at least like finally kind of, turning around on the Knicks and being more comfortable with them being really good and having really good players.
Yeah, I, I just think at the end of the day, statistically, he's just he's not in the same class as Jokic. I, I think Luka's just always going to put up 30 or more. Maybe it's maybe it's a tiny bit down this year because they just have more offensive pieces than they ever had. And beat if he's healthy, is just going to have better numbers. SGA is probably going to better numbers. And I think Oklahoma City is the one team out West that you could say, like there's a world where the Knicks get the one seed and Oklahoma City wins even more games. I, I think they're going to just have a monster, monster regular season record. You said Giannis, you said Jokic. And Ant, I just think, is probably the most popular player in the league now or or is bordering on being the most popular player in the league. So he'll get he'll get some push. I'm, I'm with you. There could be there could be a little bit of like a latent narrative there. It's just the league. The league is so deep. Like, like if Jalen Brunson was who he is right now, like, in it, like when Nash was winning it, like 2004, 2005, like forget it. Like, I, I, I think he could go on a run of MVPs. He could win two. Like, even like the first Steph MVP, like, I think there are numbers that are totally approachable from past MVPs that won it. Now, whether it's like a pace thing or, or, or a talent thing or a lack of defense thing is what older fans would tell you. Like, the, the standard is just so high. I don't think he's going to quite get there. But you know what, Alex? If he wins a finals MVP at the end of this year, no one's going to care. Um, let's get into some more awards. Uh, defensive player of the year. The Knicks have more listed candidates than any other team. Who are they? What are their chances? We will talk about that next on Locked On Knicks. But first, we got to let you know about our good friends over at FanDuel. And I love sports. I love them so much. I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games and the sports aren't sporting like I want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. And if you're like me and you're still just waiting for the Knicks to come back, uh, you know, and maybe I, you're like me and you don't feel confident enough to bet on something like baseball, then you're already looking at all these Knicks futures. I highlighted it on the last episode. I'll throw it out there again. The Knicks plus 1,000 for the in-season tournament uh, I think is pretty solid. So you got ahead of them the Celtics plus 450, the Thunder plus 750, the Bucks plus 850. I don't know why specifically the Bucks ahead of the Knicks instead of like the uh, – everybody seems to think the Sixers and Knicks are the ones that are – uh, next in line for that, maybe just assuming the Bucks will still be healthy by that point in the season early on. Either way, the Knicks plus a thousand, I think I'll take that. They're tied, they're actually tied with Minnesota and Philly, uh, for that distinction for uh, fourth place there. But I'd say, why not? I think the Knicks are going to click early, I think they're going to they're gonna come out the gate strong and they'll be in good shape to potentially win the in season tournament, especially to, to get that good seating or whatever and get you know, qualify. Sorry, not the in season tournament, the NBA Cup. Uh, at any rate, bet on that, plus 1,000 for the Knicks. So head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. All right, Gavin, we're back in, and you mentioned it before uh, we took our little break there that the Knicks have more candidates for Defensive Player of the Year listed on FanDuel odds. So you can extend it, FanDuel read. Listed on FanDuel odds, then... Uh, any other team out there. So they have OG Ananobi, they have Mikhail Bridges, they have Mitchell Robinson, and they have Josh Hart all on there. Josh Hart, little laughable. Let's just get this one out of the way. 36 best odds. You scrolled all the way down the page. You counted all the options ahead of him. Plus 40,000 for Josh Hart. Um, yeah. I'm not uh, like Kevin Malone on The Office, and I'm not going to say if anyone gives you 40,000 for <laughs> one odds on anything, you take it. Um, and I know that was plus, really, that was shockingly good. That was really uh, pretty good. good right. I, I would, uh, I'd, I'd be, I'd be concerned about how close you were. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and plus 40,000, I know is not 40,000 to one, but either way, um, you know, I think we could safely rule him out. So let's just, uh, sorry, Josh, we're going to take your name out of the discussion here, but OG Ananobi has the eighth best odds at plus 4,000. Uh, which is, I think, where things start to get a little interesting. Although maybe get a little more interesting with one of the other names on the list. But where, where are you, where are you sitting with the plus four thousand for OG? Yeah, so there, uh, OG, and I'll, I'll just spoil it. Mitch are the two ones that interest me a bit here. Mitch interests me more. But first, I'll say OG. I gave Brunson a a two out of ten on my arbitrary rating system. I'm giving OG Ananobi a a one point five out of ten, and that is nothing against OG. It is just. Pretty much impossible to win this award at this point if you're not a center. Mikhail Bridges, uh, three, four years ago now, finished second, which was exceptional. And because he was he was the linchpin of the best defense in the NBA. And that is certainly the model. But you also need a year 
where there isn't a standout big and and the ultimate thing just like i mentioned when the last segment unfortunately i'm gonna to keep bringing up uh the, the big french dude uh he had he had minus odds for this which is like extraordinary like you almost never see minus odds for an, a, a preseason award winner when it like it could credibly be like 15 to 20 guys uh, maybe even 30 if, if you look at how low mitch's odds are so that that kind of blew me away um, but the recipe for OG to get there, I, I think it would take an absolutely Herculean season. He would have to play probably at least 76 games for the first time in his career. Um, and I think a lot of it, Alex, would have to come with him playing small ball five, which I just don't think is going to happen. But I think if there was a world where he played 76 games, the Knicks had the best defense in basketball, and you saw OG at 6'8", like on national TV all year long, flying around and swatting shots at the rim, um, there's a world where like, like there could be to, the word to use with Jalen, a, a groundswell there. Um, I'll let you talk about it. I think Mitchell Robinson at plus 20K, which ironically is uh, tied with Isaiah Hartenstein uh, for the 29th best odds. Um, to me, that 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 is the long shot I'd go with. But what, what, what do you think about those two numbers? Yeah, for OG, I'll just say, I think it mostly will come down to, for him, it's it's not going to be about the counting stats. Like, like if Wembenyama wins it, it's going to be because he averages like six stocks per game which is going to be insane, but <clears throat> excuse me. I don't think his team is going to be that good, which I think is the weirdest thing for me that he's like this heavy, heavy, heavy favorite is that you could put up all the counting stats in the world, but defensive player of the year, more than almost any award, I think, I guess DPOY and MVP, like those awards don't get handed to guys on bad teams. And they certainly don't get handed to guys that are even on like middling teams. You know what I mean? Like the last middling team guy to get handed either of those awards to me was i guess russell westbrook when he won mvp like and he was still like on a six seed in a really stacked west and i think they still had like damn near 50 wins that year as like a six seed because the west was just insane during that time um so i mean you know i i think we're in a different world where i i think Wemby, i i honestly think i think there's actually a better chance that he would win mvp than dpoy if his team is like 32 wins or something like that because they would be like well without him they would have won so many fewer so many fewer games overall but i don't think he's incredibly likely to win either award just because i don't think the spurs are going to get that much better from not being that good this past year um granted you have to consider that like popovich had essentially a governor on him and that whole team for like over the first half of the year which was still bizarre to look back on but either way i think like i think you could safely say like you know, it's, it, it, I don't think he's going to win either award, if I'm being honest. So for OG, it, it would come down to like, are his impact stats insane on a Knicks team that is like a two or a one seed? And I could maybe say that happening. And that's where, that's where that groundswell would come from. The analytics community would get behind it. And I think DPOY more than any other award, the analytics community has the biggest say in. Like, that's part of what has led Gobert to so many of those awards and mm -hmm. everything is that people highlight like, no, like, you know, you can look at just the counting, you know, the blocks or whatever, and maybe he's only just as good as the other centers on this list, but the impact that he has on this game is so much more than, you know, just like how yeah. many blocks he averages or whatever. And, you know, they have all those stats to prove that. But as a, a nice segue here, I, I think that makes as much of a case as any for Mitch, who consistently has some of the best impact stats on the Knicks as far as like, when he's on the court, you know, like points allowed, field goal percentage at the rim, all that stuff just goes down drastically. I mean, his his rim defended field goal percentage, I think he's held guys to like seven or eight points below their average some years, which is insane at the rim. Um, so if he puts up those sort of numbers and the Knicks are that high up and he has better health luck, which I think is more likely for Mitch than it is for OG. Like, I just feel like OG is going to have more like odd, you know, little like, hamster mm -hmm. brains or whatever here and there that he's going to need to take a couple games off for mitch hopefully you know knock on wood i won't knock too loud to mess with our sound but i'm knocking on my desk like hopefully won't miss too much time and i think for that reason you know if he plays like 70 games or something like that and starts all of them and has great impact stats and the knicks are clearly a better team with him on the floor than off uh then i think there's a very good chance he could potentially win it because He's been one of those guys for years that I think has been sort of talked about in that class, but just hasn't 
it just has been a little snake bitten with like either the Knicks aren't having their best year, the year that he's had his best year, or he gets hurt and it takes him out of the consideration for these awards like last year. But like with how he started last year, I think that he would have been in the discussion by the end of the year if he had just kept that up the whole season. So if that happens this year, then plus 20,000 seems like a, a pretty nice little flyer to take. Yeah, I, I think the reason the odds are so low is it, it's just really hard to go from not a household name to winning an award like like pretty much anyone other than most improved and, and maybe six man. Honestly, like you almost have to have the year before the year, which if Mitchell Robinson hadn't gotten hurt last year, like he could have had that. And there might have been people saying, hey, low key, like you look at Raptor or whatever you look at. Um, uh, what's this? What there was there was a site in the stat. I can't remember now where Hartenstein was the second most impactful defensive player in the league last year. And, and you look at to your point, like some of those underlying analytics and you say, huh, like this guy was actually amazing. And you almost need that uh, nerd push, I think, is, is what you were, you were getting at, Alex, a year out. And then the next year you can win it. So that would be my main concern with Mitch. I think at the end of the day for either of those two, the Knicks just have to be the best defense in basketball. And then the thing you're worried about inherently in the Knicks having four guys on this list, even though Josh Hart, as we said, I I, I think we, we were joking pre-show that is uh, people try to take advantage of, uh, I shout out to all of you who are listening, rich finance pros who, who go to 10 Knicks games a year and don't totally know what they're talking about. And they're like, yeah, I'm going to throw 10K on Josh Hart. He's, he's pretty sick. I watched him all throughout the playoffs. Um, he, he should not be on that list. But like guys could take votes away from each other. You have the next two of the best defense. But last year, I think part of the reason Gobert wanted, even though he's not a super popular dude and he's already won it a bunch of times, is because Minnesota was 2.2 points better than any other team in the NBA in terms of defensive rating. I think the Knicks would have to be the best defense by that margin. And you know what? We'll we'll, we'll talk about it as we 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 go through our our preseason stuff. Like I, I don't think that's impossible. I, I I think there's like only Oklahoma City can say that they're putting three defenders on the floor consistently as good as the the combination of Mitch, OG, Mikhail. So if those guys stay healthy, like the Knicks have a chance. Right now, I would say Minnesota and Oklahoma City, given that they have Caruso, they have Lou Dort, they have Shea, who's solid, they have J-Dub, who's solid, Chet, and iHeart. Like, they would probably be my favorite right now for the best defense and someone to come out of this with the award because of it. But the Knicks have a chance to be in those conversations. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, it's... I, I feel like it's it's a double edged sword for them. Like, it, it, there's also a chance that all of the Knicks potential candidates for an award like this just cannibalize one another. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Like, I just think, I think it's it, you know, it, they might have the best defense in the league, but not the defensive player of the year, and that might just happen. You know, it's it, to your point. You know, they it Gobert stands head and shoulders above the rest of his contemporaries on his team or whatever, and. The Knicks just, you know, it's going to be a, it's going to be a village, you know, it, it, it's going to take a village to win that sort of award or just get that sort of recognition for their defense this year. And that might ultimately kind of kill them. Um, especially even like OG, like if he's, if he looks like a better defender and whatever, but you still have bridges out there that can absorb, you know, guarding the second best player on a team. Or like if the Knicks run into a Tyrese Maxey, that's sort of cooking OG and he has the security blanket of, bridges behind him i think that gets held against him mm -hmm. ultimately in voting you know where it's like oh well you know you're the best wing defender on this team but you have another really great wing defender who is a defensive player of the year candidate just a few years ago right right behind you is your number two as far as best defender on this team on the perimeter i, I think there's a good chance it kind of hurts them but um someone who maybe has a better shot would be josh hart at the six man award or perhaps tom thibodeau to win another coach of the year or <laughs> hilariously maybe Paco Mdotti to win a rookie of the year don't think that one's super likely but let's talk through the remaining award candidates in just a second all right Gavin we're back in to keep talking through these odds that have come out for the individual awards for the Knicks this year and we got Josh Hart up next for six man of the year award and uh we also have Dante DiVincenzo uh, on the list as well they're actually tied uh, tied at plus sixteen hundred each. Uh, so let's let's talk about these two guys and maybe their case here. Uh, ahead of them, Malik Monk, Naz Reed, Alex Caruso, Jordan Clarkson, Norm Powell. In my opinion, not the strongest field. I like. I actually think that this is a pretty good one to bet on. Like at plus sixteen hundred, if you want to throw down like five ten bucks on both of them and hope that maybe you get a really nice hit at the end of the year, like. I mean, not life changing money or anything, but you know, enough to go out and watch a playoff game and drink for free. Um, you know, maybe it's worth it. I, I think this is pretty solid. Like, 
plus 1600 odds is is pretty steep for two guys that played starter quality uh play last year especially dante who was the again i must stress for the millionth time the third third best three-point shooter in the league behind steph curry and luka Doncic, and threes taken threes made and one of the best guys in three-point percentage as well and which you cannot say for Luka Doncic, who shoots a high volume but does not shoot the highest percentage. Mm -hmm. Like Dante took a Steph Curry ish volume and made him at a Steph Curry ish level, which is crazy. And so he might very well score 15 points off the bench next year. Um, you know, if, if he's able to carve out enough minutes and everything. And I guess then it would come down to do some of the, the extra stats work out. Do they, uh, how heavily do they consider, like, oh, if he's averaging. 15 points a game in 23 minutes a game or something like that versus some other candidate who plays 30 minutes off the bench and is averaging like 22 points a game or something like that. Like how would they weigh that? But I do feel like we're in a world where there's less of those like Lou Williams type guys or Jr. Yeah. Smith type it's guys. Kind of Malik Monk, right? Like he's, he's really the main dude you yeah. would think of that's still in that category. I get like, I'm looking at the list like Jordan Clarkson, Norm Powell have a bit of that, but Clarkson, I think, is kind of past his prime, and Powell, mm -hmm. like, always seems to be on like the periphery of those conversations. So, yeah, I, th I think it's possible. Yeah, and I mean, Powell is maybe also almost getting towards the point where you can say that he's past his prime a little bit. Like, his role is not huge with the Clips. Granted, it might be bigger this year, but he also might find himself in a starting spot. So, it might be foolish to put him as the sixth man when there's a chance that he might have to step in and be a starter with Paul George out of there. So, yeah, I think. I mean, and this also just isn't an award, I think, that other than, again, like Lou Williams, who won it a bunch of times for just being a guy who, for whatever reason, was starter caliber but would only come off the bench. Um, you don't really see repeat winners in this award either. Jamal Crawford, our, our guy, the one other one. True, yeah. Jamal it's, Crawford. It's really, it's really, and I guess Manu and his probably won a few, but those, those are those are the only ones I can think of. Exactly, yeah. And, I mean, that, that era seems to be kind of past. So, I, mm -hmm. you know, seeing – Nas Reed win it again. Not super likely to me. I don't know. I, I think one of the Knicks have a pretty good chance here. I'm with you. I think I think there's a window. I think I, I'm I think it's Stephen Chen's is more likely than Hart. You you just always ironically after I was, I was crapping on Josh Hart's defense relatively. I just I don't think he's a defensive player. The year candidate last segment. He he's more of the more of the defensive option. And and Stephen Chen's is also a good defender. But I, I just think statistically he is going to stand out more. My only concern there is is and you this what you're alluding to is like just is there enough shots on a night to night basis? Like I I think he is going to have to shoot something like 45% from three to get to 15 points a game, just because you're going to have Mikhail scoring. Like I think OG is going to want to score. Julius is not looking to take a step back. Jalen is not looking to take a major step back. Like Deuce, when he's on the floor is going to get his shots up. Like they're like Hart will have his transition buckets. There are just a lot of mouths to feed. That being said, like as big of a leap as Dante made last year, like, like, could we really put it past him to come back this year and be like, all right, if, if the Knicks hadn't added all these dudes, he would have been a 20 point scorer this season. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I think it's totally plausible. Um, I, I think Dante is the one I would lean towards. I think Josh will have a really good season. I just don't think the statistics, like he would have to put up a double, double, like he'd have to get to 10 rebounds and have to get to four or five assists. And like, that's where I would like, if you ask me one guy to pick on this list, like probably I would go. Norm Powell would be the one whose odds I like the best just because I, I think with everything the Clippers lost, if he is still coming off the bench, he could have like a Jamal, like it, it's always a Clipper, right? It's Jamal Crawford, Lou Williams. He could follow in that role, put up like 20 points a game. Malik Monk, even though he's the favorite, he's going to be really hurt. I think by them getting DeRozan, like, like there is just a lot less responsibility for him there. Um, but to, to, for the, for the sake of uh, brevity, uh, I, I agree with you on Dante DiVincenzo. Yeah, and uh, if we want to move on to the next category here, Coach of the Year, mm -hmm. guys, always kind of in this discussion, Tom Thibodeau, uh, plus 850 odds to win the award. That is tied with Ime Udoka for the best of, the best uh, odds to win the award this year. Uh, right behind them is Taylor Jenkins, plus 900, uh, Nick Nurse, plus 1,000, Mark Dagnall, plus 1,200, Chris Finch, plus 1,300, so... I don't think we need to go beyond that point, but um, I, I kind of, I'm kind of buying this one. I mean, I think plus eight fifty is the favorite is pretty solid. Granted, that is one of the most unpredictable awards out there. I feel like it's just, it's, I, it's, I don't even like know what the criteria is. Sometimes, you know, it's like 
is it the biggest turnaround? Is it the, you know, just the team that did the best relative to expectations? Like, is it just straight up the coach of the best team, you know, like who seems to have done the best job with the hand he's mm -hmm. been dealt? That's usually Tibbs. I mean, so he's kind of always right in the thick of this discussion because he always gets the most out of his team during the regular season, which is, you know, what this award is based off of. I, I feel like similar to the Jalen Brunson MVP discussion, it would have to be like the Knicks would have to be the number one seat most likely for him to win this award. I just feel like since he's already won it with the Knicks, it would need to be like he needs to one up that performance. And he already has done that to, like not the first year of Brunson, but last year he certainly won up his previous coach of the year uh, campaign and got the number two seed, 150 games, all that, and yet still didn't really seem like a real candidate for the award. I forget if he was listed under the finalists or not. Um, I know he got, I know he got some votes, but I don't think that he was in the final three. So I, was, I just think he was not in the. He wasn't in the top four. Last yeah, year. it was okay. Dagnold, Finch, Mosley. Was oh, that was the top three. Sorry. Right. I think he might have been number four or something like that, but or maybe number five because I feel like they probably would have had to have Missoula in there too, just with how good the Celtics were. I don't know. Either way, I just think I, I think it maybe is a little bit fool's goal to have him. The yeah, favorite. so you, you nailed it. He was sorry. He was one spot behind Missoula. He was fifth last year. There. We, wow. <laughs> oh, jeez. I should make odds or something yeah. <laughs> for a living. That would be a terrible idea. I should not do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I'm kind of with this, but kind of also out on it. I just feel like it would take such an outlier season from the Knicks for them to, I mean, also like how many coaches have won three coach of the year awards? Like, I, I think the Knicks would have to win. I'm going to say 62 games and have the best record in the league. I, I, I don't see any way he wins it. If I, I Taylor Jenkins to me is, is good money there because Memphis is going to make a big jump and people aren't going to be like, well, they just got healthy. They're going to be like, whoa, Taylor Jenkins. And they have a great roster. I think they're a big bounce back candidate this year. That's that's where I would go personally. Yeah, I think so too. I'm, I'm just looking up. Now I'm just curious. We're just, we're just like turning this into trivia hour. Yeah. Uh, most <laughs> NBA coaches. Now it's August. Right? Now's, now's the time. <laughs> Uh, Greg Popovich, Don Nelson, and Pat Riley have each won the award three times. So that would wow. literally put Tibbs in immortality, sure. basically, at that yeah. point. And what's crazy um, is like Spolstra's probably been the best coach in the league for a decade. And like I don't know if it's that close, and he's never won it, which is... Yeah, it is crazy. And yeah, and then the two-time winners that Tibbs has already appears with, Hubie Brown, Mike Brown, Mike Budenholzer, Mike D'Antoni, Bill Fitch, Cotton Fitzsimmons, Gene Shue. Tom so Phil Jackson really got taken for granted, huh? Is he... that, that's true too, man. Yeah. yeah. All right, never mind. Maybe this award means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this award just doesn't actually mean anything. I don't know. Either way, um, Where, where's Derek Fisher's coach of the year? Right? It's it's seriously. Reality. If he's not on the list, I don't I don't want to hear it. Yeah. Um, or uh, David Fisdale. David Fisdale's never won this. What a, mm -hmm. what a clown show. Ooh, Mickey what Mouse are we doing here? Clearly, the, art, the other Mike Miller. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he should have won it that one year, man. He <laughs> turned that season around. He laid the foundation for the Knicks that we know today. Yeah. If we're being completely honest, or if, um, when the Knicks win the title, the first segment's all about Mike Miller. All about Mike Miller. Yeah, yeah. it's the first segment of we'll, we'll have tears streaming down our faces. <laughs> I just really want to thank Mike Miller. Yeah, for everything. <laughs> he all right, started uh, this all in 2019 20. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, we, we can we can wrap this up very quickly because it's not going to happen. With Rookie of the Year, uh, the 19th best odds, Alex, for Rookie of the Year, Pacom Dottie, the same odds that Mitchell Robinson has to win Defensive Player of the Year, Pacom Dottie, who on this pod two episodes ago, I picked to play less than 70 total minutes this year, um, has the 19th best odds at plus 20,000. I will make a promise to you now, if Pacom Dottie wins Rookie of the Year, or you know what, even gets a vote for Rookie of the Year, I will sing the French National Anthem with my underwear on my head on this podcast. That is how sure I am he is not going to get a vote for Rookie of the Year. I'll just say, if if anyone gives you plus 20,000 odds on anything, <laughs> you take it. Um, no, yeah. that I mean, the the more like the better money there is plus 20,000 for Colic, mm -hmm. you know. So, but both would just be like, you may as well just light a couple bucks on fire at that point. So don't bet that. Take whatever money you're thinking of putting on Dottie and just put it on Mitch. Uh, and, and, you know, potentially actually make money. Um, the Knicks have no, uh, most improved player, uh, candidates, no huge surprise there. And then clutch player of the year, they have Brunson in fifth at plus 1200. That would imply that uh, I'm going to put my Homer hat on and just say, 
that would imply that the Knicks are going to be in a lot of close games, and they won't be because they're just going to be blowing everybody out of the water. So, uh, of course, he won't win that award. So don't put your money there either. Just take whatever money you were going to put on Brunson at plus 1,200 for Clutch Player of the Year and put it on Mitchell Robinson. I thought you were going to circle back and be like, put that money on Pacom. Yeah. Put that money on Pacom and then take that money and put it on Mitch instead. Yeah, exactly. there, you uh, go. there you go. We'll just keep it. Keep the train going. Yeah. <laughs> sort of a Ponzi scheme of, of betting on uh, on these guys. Yeah. Nothing like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly the vibes we want to give yeah. off here right at the end of the show. Anyways, the show is sponsored by FanDuel. <laughs> <laughs> but don't listen to that part, FanDuel. We'll leave this off. All right, we got to quit now before we get canceled by our sponsor. Uh, thank you all for listening. We'll have uh, plenty more episodes for you guys coming up, especially if any news breaks. Uh, not anticipating there's going to be anything huge, but let's say Julius Randle extends or something like that. We'll definitely be here for you guys for that. Uh, but till next time, thank you all for listening, and we'll talk to you soon. Peace out, everybody.